You may remember the experience of Martin Luther as he was on his pilgrimage to Rome. He had finally arrived to that so-called holy city, and as he was climbing up Peter's staircase on his knees, suddenly he heard the words from Romans chapter 1 and verse 17. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. As he heard the words, the just shall live by faith, conscience struck him and he realized he was doing what is wrong. Why is faith so important? Why is it so important for us to first of all understand what is faith and then to possess that faith that is mentioned in this verse? Well, let's look at 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4. 1 John chapter 5 verse 4 tells us why it is so important to understand what is faith. 1 John 5 4, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. What is the victory that overcomes the world? Our faith. That means that if you possess faith, what do you possess? You possess victory. Victory over what? Victory over the world. What are we talking about when we speak about victory over the world? We're talking about victory over sin. Many times in our life, we get tired of battles. We get tired of going into, every time we, we, we turn around, we're going from one conflict to another. The reason being is because we experience defeat. When an army is not experiencing defeat, but they're experiencing victory every time, they look forward to the next engagement. But what about us? Do you want to have that faith? Do you want to have that victory that overcomes the world? Well, you must possess faith. Now, what is that faith that produces victory over the world? What is that real faith? Well, there are two types of faith. One type of faith that produces victory and the other type of faith is mentioned in James chapter 2 and verse 19. James 2 and verse 19. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils believe and tremble. So if you have merely belief, the best you're going to have is called trembling. Is that what you want? I don't want that either. So let us go a little bit further to understand the distinction between these two. Now, there is that faith that produces victory. Now we have an example of that faith in the experience of Abraham. Let's look at Galatians chapter 3, verses 6 through 9. Galatians 3, 6 through 9. Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then they which are of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. It says here that Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And then it goes on and talks that Abraham had faith. And because Abraham's belief was in reality faith, at least later on in his experience, as we'll examine shortly, then those who are of faith, they are the children of Abraham. All those who have faith, every one of us, if we possess faith, we are a child of Abraham. Not an imaginary child, not a figurative child. We are the children of Abraham. If you are a child of Abraham, then the promises that were promised to Abraham, those promises belong to you. Now, why was Abraham considered a father of the faithful? Abraham did, is not called the father of the faithful because he invented faith. 
He simply came into a closer relationship with God that God, the originator of faith, was able to explain it in a clearer manner to Abraham. And Abraham not only understood the explanation, but to Abraham this experience of faith became a reality. It was in his life that from time to time he kept taking those big steps in faith. Yes, there were failures on occasion, but he learned from those failures and moved onward. The first record of the experience of Abraham's faith is found in Genesis 12, 1 to 3. Genesis 12, 1 to 3. We have a picture of the faith of Abraham. Now this is the early picture of faith. Later on we'll look at the later picture of faith. Now the Lord said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. In you all the families of the earth are going to be blessed. Now what does God tell Abraham? God says, get you out. What does it mean, get you out? There's another word that I like. The word is Abraham separate. That's right. The very first message to Abraham was a message of separation. Why is separation absolutely necessary? Or is separation absolutely necessary in our Christian experience? It was necessary for Abraham. God says, get you out. God said, separate. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 17, 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 17, we are told, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. What does he say? First separate, and then I will receive you. And then it goes on and says in the next verse, You shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Do you want to be a son of God? Do you want to be a daughter of God? Then the message of separation comes to us. Now why is this message of separation so important? Why is it so important to take this step of separation? Volume 1, Testament for the Church, page 278. Volume 1, 278. It is the duty of every child of God to inquire, wherein am I separate from the world? What is our duty? Our duty is to question ourselves, in what am I separated from the world? Volume 2, 441. Volume 2, 441. Christ's followers are required to come out from the world and be separate and touch not the unclean. And they have the promise of being sons and daughters of the Most High, members of the royal family. But if the conditions are not complied with on their part, they will not, cannot, realize the fulfillment of the promise. If we do not fulfill the conditions of separating, then we cannot receive the promises of God. Now why does God require us to separate? What is the reason for this separation? We have the example of Samson in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 563. Patriarchs and Prophets 563 records a disastrous experience with Samson because he did not accept the message of separation. It says here, At his marriage feast, Samson was brought into familiar association with those who hated the God of Israel. Listen to this now. Whoever voluntarily enters into such relations will feel it necessary to conform in some degree to the habits and customs of his companions. That's right. If we voluntarily enter into a friendship with unbelievers, what happens? 
It says here, we will to some degree feel it necessary to conform to their habits, customs, and even we can add practices. We have to make a choice of our companions. We have to make a choice of our friends. Now what was he to separate from? What did God say? The first thing God says unto Abraham, get you out of your country. When you come out of your country, you are going to be a stranger in a strange land. All who separate today, what are we going to be? We are simply sojourners. We are strangers in this land. We are pilgrims. If we accept the message of faith, if we accept the message of separation, what is going to become of national barriers? What is going to happen with each one of us saying, oh, I'm this type of a person from this country? The message of God to us is, get you out of your country. When we come together, we are not Serbians or Brazilians or Australians or Americans or wherever else we come from. The first thing we are is we have the faith of Abraham. The first thing we are, we are children of Abraham. The first message of God came to him and it says, get you out. When we unite to Jesus, number one, we are of a new country. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people that ye should show forth the praises of Him who hath called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. We are a holy nation. We as a church are the nation of God. And therefore, God told Abraham, get you out from your country because you are another nation. When we accept Jesus, our primary citizenship is in heaven. We are one in the kingdom of God. And what else was easy to separate from? What else did it say? Now the Lord said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house. So what's the second point of separation? First it is our country, second it is our family. Both our extended family and our immediate family. It says there, get thee out of thy country and from your kindred and from your father's house. Why? Why make this separation? Why is this separation so important for us? And when we're talking about faith, why is it? Patriarchs and Prophets, page 126. Patriarchs and Prophets, 126. In order that God may qualify him for his great work as the keeper of the sacred oracles, Abraham must be separate from the associations of his early life. That's right. To prepare him for that work that God intended him. To make him qualified, he had to separate from the associations of his early life. Many times until we take that step of separation from the associations of our early life, we are unprepared to go into the work that God has for us. Why? Because the influence of kindred and friends would interfere with the training which the Lord purposed to give His servant. Now that Abraham was in a special sense connected with heaven, he must dwell among strangers. His character must be peculiar, differing from all the world. He could not even explain his course of action so as to be understood by his friends. 
spiritual things are spiritually discerned, and his motives and actions were not comprehended by his idolatrous kindred. You see, the influence that the early family has, the early friends have, that influence to Abraham could not develop his character as necessary. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 14. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 14. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Now, God told him to come out of Ur of Chaldees. Ur was one of those lush areas, those fertile plains, a place where he could amass wealth very easily. And God tells Abraham, get away from here, and I am going to show you where you are going to go. What does Abraham do? God speaks. God speaks. God's Word speaks. So in the first place, God's Word comes to Abraham and says, Abraham, separate. Now, when God's Word says, Abraham, separate, what does Abraham do? What does Abraham do? Abraham acts. God says, Abraham, get thee out. Abraham starts packing his bags. You could imagine his friends. His friends come to him. Abraham, where are you going? Oh, God will show me. What is the land like over there? I don't know. Is the land fertile? I don't know. Is it a wilderness? I don't know. I know one thing. God says, go. And it must be a good place because God's sending me there. Hebrews 11, verse 8. Hebrews 11, verse 8. By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out not knowing whither he went. He obeyed. He did not know where he was going. Patriarch and Prophets 126 again. It was no light test that was thus brought upon Abraham. No small sacrifice that was required of him. There were strong ties to bind him to his country, his kindred, and his home. But he did not hesitate to obey the call. He had no questions to ask concerning the land of promise, whether the soil was fertile and the climate healthful, whether the country afforded agreeable surroundings and would afford opportunities for amassing wealth. God speaks. What does Abraham do? This action comes as a result of two things. First of all, he believed God. Remember? It says in Galatians 3, Abraham believed God and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. But what else did Abraham do? Abraham not only believed what God said, Abraham had implicit trust. So if we were to make this into an equation, we would have to say that belief plus trust equals faith. It must be belief plus trust. Abraham trusted implicitly to what God's Word had told him. God's Word says, go. He had no questions. As we are studying many points to d in our series here, you may be questioning to yourself, should I do this or should I not? Do I believe this or do I not believe it? Well, according to this 
the experience of Abraham. There's only one question that we need to know. The one question is, does God's Word say it? If God's Word says it, that is enough. There is no more questions. Abraham did not question God. Abraham trusted in what God says. What is the result of trusting in God? Notice it goes on the same paragraph in page 126. God has spoken and His servant must obey. And listen to this. The happiest place on earth for him was the place where God would have him be. Oh, brethren, if we could only understand this, if we could only grasp a hold of this precious promise right here, that the happiest place for me on earth is not where I think. The happiest place for me on earth is the place where God would have me to be. Are you searching for happiness? You cannot find it. You cannot travel from place to place to find happiness. It, you won't find it there. Ha because happiness is not found in your environment. Change your environment. That's not going to bring you happiness. We often think, oh, if I could only have a different environment, I'll be happy. No, no. In, you don't find happiness as a result of your environment. Happiness is the result of being in the place where God would have you to be. You may think, oh, if only I could get married, then I'll be happy. On the other hand, some say, if only I could be divorced, I could be happy. But no, that is not where happiness is found. Happiness is found in obeying God, in being where God will have you to be. When God told Abraham, get thee out of Ur of Chaldees, get you out of your country, out of your father's house. If a when Abraham understood the word of God, he was happy to leave because God said so. Does God ask us to leave something for the sake of His cause? I want to read another paragraph here on, down further on that page, 126 to 127. Many are still tested as was Abraham. They do not hear the voice of God speaking directly from heaven, but He calls them by the teachings of His Word and the events of His providence. They may be required to abandon a career that promises wealth and honor, to leave congenial and profitable associations and separate from kindred, to enter upon what appears to be only a path of self-denial, hardship, and sacrifice. God has a work for them to do. But a life of ease and the influence of friends and kindred would hinder the development of the very traits essential for its accomplishment. He calls them away from human influences and aid and leads them to feel the need of His help and to depend upon Him alone that He may reveal Himself to them. Who is ready at the call of providence to renounce cherished plans and familiar associations? Who will accept new duties and enter untried fields, doing God's work with firm and willing heart? For Christ's sake, counting his losses gain. He who will do this has the faith of Abraham and will share with him that far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory with which the sufferings of the present time are not worthy to be compared. 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and Romans 8, 18. Sometimes we think we have to call people into the work who have nothing to do. But when Jesus Christ called the twelve apostles, who did He call? Matthew was a businessman. Matthew was working at the seat of custom. He was very busy. He had a lot of taxes to deal with. And what did Jesus tell him? He came by and he says, Matthew, come and follow me. What did Matthew do? Oh, 
wait, this is the most profitable year I've ever had. Let me take a little bit more time and glean a little bit more profits. You know, the cause of God will be benefited by my work a little bit longer here. Will it be benefited? Oh, you know something? God needs those type of active people. God needs people when business is going great. God calls them. And what about the other ones? They were just fishing all night long and Jesus came there and did a miracle. And they were full of fish. They never had so many fish in their life. And they were pulling in the nets. And as they were pulling in the nets, what did Jesus say? Come and follow me. What did they do? They left the nets with somebody else. They left all those full boatload of fish. And they left to follow Jesus, to enter into His work. And I tell you, one more year of profitable business would not have been worth the one year they spent with Jesus. I'll never forget my own experience. I had just finished a missionary school. I was 18 years old, full of life. The future was ahead of me. And as I went to visit my uncle, he made an offer to me. He said, I would like you to be a partner in the business together with me. There was nothing wrong with the business. It was a very good business. He wanted to start a new venture. He was very successful in all the businesses he had started. And now he wanted to start a new venture. But he needed someone to be a partner in that venture. And he guaranteed me $40,000 the very first year. This is going back in 1979. $40,000. A young man, 18 years old, and he makes this offer. I looked at him and I said, no. He says, this may never come to you again, this offer. That is true, it never did come again. But I never regretted it. Because God's Word says that we are not to enter into partnership with unbelievers. That's right. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And that verse in my mind made it very clear, I cannot do that. Well, so then I turned away from there and I went to Los Angeles to work for my uncle who is a believer in construction. It was a beautiful time that I spent there. I began to learn how to build. Learning construction was very important. And after being there for some time, we decided that we need to start the apprenticeship, the official apprenticeship in tile setting, in European tile setting. Oh, what a wonderful thing. We made all the plans. We decided, okay, January 1st, we're going to start the official apprenticeship for four years. I looked forward to that. And it was while I was looking forward to that apprenticeship and looking forward also that every two weeks I had an increase in my wages. I was really happy for that. Things are going great. It was at that time that I was invited to enter the work. I wasn't sure. I need to learn this apprenticeship. The test, that the, the desire to enter that was there. I loved it. I loved my work. I loved every minute of it. I loved that construction job. Finally I decided, well, I'm going to have to have a sign from the Lord on this one. I am not sure whether I should enter in or not. I was at that time only 19 years old to enter into a work. So finally I prayed to the Lord and I said, okay, I need a sign. If my uncle says go, then I'm going to go. A couple days later we were working at Marina del Rey and we were putting in tile on the floor and in the kitchen, the whole kitchen floor. And also we were putting tile up on the floor in one of the bathrooms upstairs. We're working in the bathroom and at that time this whole thing was turmoil going in my mind. My uncle thought I was in love or something at first and he thought, do you have some kind of girlfriend or something? No. And he kept quiet for a while and he turned to me and he asked me, 
Are you going to be a contractor? Or are you going to be a minister? I couldn't believe his question. Two days later, yes, two days later, I was walking the streets of Canada as a missionary. As I look back at those experiences from that time onward, I never regretted it. And after being two months in Canada, the brethren asked me to go and help develop the work in Washington, they say. I accepted. And after accepting that call, I had to go back to California to get all my belongings. And someone asked me, they said, um, would you like to come to Washington, D.C. first to take a look to see whether you like the place, whether you like the environment, whether you like the weather? Come and take a look. I said, there's no purpose to look. They said, yeah, what happens if you don't like the weather? What happens if you don't like the people? I said, the, the question, that's the wrong question. Is God sending me there? Or is He not sending me there? If God is sending me there, there is no question. The happiest place for me will be to go where God would have me to be. And I look back, I never regretted it. I never regretted that type of experience. That's why God says in this message of faith, the very first thing is to separate. Do we trust God? When God asks us to move to another place, to move to another city, to move to another state, to move to another country, are we going to experience the faith of Abraham? Or are we going to say, well, I've been here for so long, I don't think I should move. Well, Abraham had lived in Ur of Chaldees for 70 some odd years. And what did God say? Pack up and move. So if you haven't lived somewhere 70 years, then that's still a good time to pack up and leave. If God says, move. Now you may think to yourself, well, that's good for missionaries, but what about me? Well, this actually comes to every single one of us. In Christ Object Lessons, page 330, it says, In making a profession of faith in Christ, we pledge ourselves to become all that it is possible for us to be as workers for the Master. Every one of us are workers for the Lord. Every single one of us. Now, you may not be a full-time employee. No, that's not necessary. Some are called to give up everything to give up our careers and give up everything else for the cause of God. Others are called to remain in those careers. But at the same time, we are pledging ourselves to become all that it is workers for the Master. That means each of us are workers. And until every church member realizes this, the work will never be finished. In volume 9, page 117, Volume 9, 117. The work of God in the earth can never be finished until the men and women comprising our church membership rally to the work and unite their efforts with those of ministers and church officers. Every one of us as members has a responsibility. And you may be in an environment right now. Maybe you're in a church or in a city that has heard the truth, that knows the truth, and there's plenty of people around you in the church that know the truth. There is time for you to spread your wings. It is time to get out of there and go into the mission field. Go to somewhere where the gospel has not been preached. Go to somewhere where this message of truth has not been heard, this message for this present time. And to go out there. Maybe it is another city in your own state. Maybe it's another state. Maybe it's another country. But the time is to experience that faith of Abraham. So he went out by faith. This faith was not an impression that came to Abraham. 
It was not a feeling. It was not an emotion. It was a thus saith the Lord. God's word came to Abraham and said, Go. Matter of fact, when God said go, it was contrary to feeling. It was contrary to emotions. This message to get out was message based on one thing and one thing alone. God's Word said it. Tell me something. Does God's Word tell you something? You may not feel like it. It may not seem to be pleasant. But it is the most pleasant thing that can ever happen to you is to accept the call that God has given to you. Being away from my family, away from the home where I grew up, yes, there were times I missed it. But I want to tell you something. It was worth more to me to be out there and seeing a soul give their heart to the Lord. To learn, to have my own experiences. To, yes, spread my wings and fly. That's what God wants from you. God wants us to experience that. That is the faith of Abraham, based solely upon the Word and the Word alone. Again on page 126 of Patriarchs and Prophets, Abraham's unquestioning obedience is one of the most striking evidences of faith to be found in the Bible. What was it? His unquestioning obedience. That is faith. If you are not experiencing unquestioning obedience to a thus saith the Lord, then you don't have the faith of Abraham. And if you don't have the faith of Abraham, you will never, never possess the blessings of Abraham. Abraham's unquestioning obedience is one of the most striking evidences of faith found in the Bible. To him, faith was the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Relying upon the divine promise, without the least outward appearance of its fulfillment, he abandoned home and kindred and native land and went forth, he knew not whither, to a follow where God should lead. By faith he became a sojourner in the land of promise, as in a land not his own, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. Sometimes we say, well, I believe. And we don't trust in God. That belief will only produce trembling. For this reason, it's like the Messages Book 1, page 389. Selected the Messages Book 1, 389. When God pardons the sinner, remits the punishment he deserves, and treats him as though he had not sinned, he receives him into divine favor and justifies him through the merits of Christ's righteousness. The sinner can be justified only through faith in the atonement made through God's dear Son, who became a sacrifice for the sins of the guilty world. No one can be justified by any works of his own. He can be delivered from the guilt of sin, from the condemnation of the law, from the penalty of transgression, only by the virtue of the suffering, death, and resurrection of Christ. Faith is the only condition upon which justification can be obtained. And faith includes not only belief, but trust. That's right. Belief plus trust equals faith. Belief only will actually end up in unbelief eventually. Youth Instructor, March 1st, 1900. Youth Instructor, March 1st, 1900. The faith that accepts Christ as one who is able to save to the uttermost all who come unto God by Him means perfect belief and trust. To be intelligently convinced is not enough. To be intelligently convinced that this is truth. You may be intelligently convinced that each video, you look at it and say, wow, according to the Word, that's it. That is not enough. You have to trust it. What does it mean to trust Jesus? I'll never forget the story that was told about this famous tightrope walker. And what he did, 
he put this tightrope all the way across Niagara Falls. And when he put this tightrope all the way across Niagara Falls, he got up on that rope, tested it out the rope, and the people gathered together to see this miracle take place, this wonder to take place. And they gathered around and he asked the people, do you believe I can walk on this tightrope across Niagara Falls? Well, they have seen him walk many tight ropes. So they said, yeah, yeah, we believe. And he said, all right, bring it up here. Bring what? Bring a wheelbarrow. And he put the wheelbarrow up and he stuck the wheelbarrow on that tight rope. Then he says, okay. He asked the individual, do you believe I can push this wheelbarrow up across Niagara Falls? And he began to show, pushing the wheelbarrow there. See, do you think I can push this wheelbarrow up across Niagara Falls? And the man says, yes. He says, okay, jump in. There was a difference. There was a difference between belief. Belief was passive. Belief was looking at that and saying, yes, I believe you can do it, and sits back and watches. But what does faith do? Faith is trust. It trusts in the Word of God. It's willing to jump in and risk everything, trusting in nothing but the Word of God. If you had to sit in that wheelbarrow, you had absolutely no control of what was going to happen then. You had total control to jump in, but once you are in, there was nothing else you can do. The question is, do we trust God like that? Do we trust God so implicitly? Yes, we have the full conscience and control of jumping in and taking the Word of God. But trusting is that faith that is the victory. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. This is the victory. When God says go, we go. When God says stop, we stop. In Selected Messages, Book 3, page 426 and 427. Selected Messages, Book 3, 426 to 427, it says, Before giving us the baptism of the Holy Spirit, our Heavenly Father will try us to see if we can live without dishonoring Him. God wants us to experience that, to leave all that Babylonian baggage behind, and then and only then are we going to receive the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Well, now we go to another experience of Abraham. We have no time to explain how Abraham went into the Canaan land and he had failures there. He had two experiences with Sarah, his sister, and claiming that she was only his sister and not his wife. You know those things. I'm not going to go to those experiences. Now, later on, God says to Abraham, I'm going to make a great nation out of you. Abraham believed that. But sometimes when belief we go no further than trust that it becomes unbelief. So after a length of time, they decided they need to help God a little bit. You see, God says, you're going to have a child, and you're going to have all these children, and He doesn't even have one child. And so in chapter 16 of Genesis, we find the experience there that Sarah says, you know, we need to help God a little bit, and you know, there's my servant here, Hagar. Why don't you go and have a child through her? And we can help God fulfill those promises. Till today, we find the consequences of that. It was a tragic experience, and it was a tragic experience because he believed God. He believed that God says, you're going to have a great nation come out of you. But they did not trust God, and that's how they ended up with the Ishmaelites. When Ishmael got a little bit older, we find that God comes to Abraham again in Genesis chapter 17, verse 15 and 16. And we're going to find the results of belief only here. Genesis 17, 15 and 16, And God said unto Abraham, As for Sarai thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall her name be. And I will bless her and give thee a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. Now what did Abraham do when he heard that Sarah is going to have a child? The next verse. Then Abraham fell upon his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is a hundred years old? And shall Sarah that is ninety years old bear? Now what would you do? Sometimes we, laugh, we think how terrible for Abraham to, to, to laugh on God 
And later on, Sarah herself laughed too. But remember, Abraham laughed first. He laughed. <laughs> Have a child? <laughs> Impossible. That cannot be done. But you know something? God wanted to give them a child, but He could not give them a child until they had implicit trust. They had to learn what it means to trust God. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 11, we find it through faith. Also, Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Why did she have a child? It is because she had faith. In other words, from the time they laughed to the time that child was conceived, there came a point in their experience where they had genuine, trusting faith in God. We must experience that for ourselves. Because of Abraham's failures, God had to give him another test of faith. Abraham is getting old now. Sarah is old. Isaac is now a young man. And the message of God comes in Genesis 22, verse 1. Genesis 22 and verse 1. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, he said, Behold, here I am. Now what does this mean, tempt? What type of temptation is this if God does not tempt anyone? In Bible Commentary, Volume 1, page 1094, what is temptation? It is the means by which those who claim to be the children of God are tested and tried. We read that God tempted Abraham, that He tempted the children of Israel. This means that He permitted circumstances to occur to test their faith and lead them to look to Him for help. God permits temptations to come to His people today that they may realize that He is their helper. If they draw nigh to Him when they are tempted, He strengthens them to meet the temptation. Now, when the message came to Abraham, go and offer up your son as a sacrifice, why did Abraham get up and do that? What was the reason? You know why? Abraham recognized the voice of God. In order for you and me to understand what God says, we must first have a relationship with God. In John chapter 10, verse 27, John 10, verse 27, Jesus says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Yes, my sheep hear my voice. Why did Abraham get this severe test. What was the reason? Because this was a very severe test. Why? You know why? Because of failure. In Four Bible Commentary, page 1146, it says, God's children are always being tested in the furnace of affliction. If they endure the first trial, it is not necessary for them to pass through the similar ordeal the second time. But if they fail, the trial is brought to them again and again, each time being still more trying and severe. If you fail once on a test that God gives you, don't think it will go away. It's going to come again. The next time will be more trying and severe. And what happens if you fail again? Well, it's going to come again. You see, God wants to save you. And the only way you can be saved is to pass the test. If you want to have an easier way to the kingdom of God, just pass the test each time. But if you want to have a difficult time, then have the failures. But you've got to go through it again. More difficult and more severe. Abraham was tested. And because of his failures a few times, he had to go through this very severe test of his faith. How did God test Abraham? Genesis 22, verse 2 and 3. And he said, 
Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. Take who? Take now thy son, thine only son. And Abraham rose up early in the morning, and saddled his ass, and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and clave the wood for the burnt offering, and rose up, and went into the place which God had told him. God says, go. Abraham got up, and what did he do? He went. We read in page 155 of Patriarch and Prophets, Heavenly beings were witnesses of the scene as the faith of Abraham and the submission of Isaac were being tested. Both of them were being tested. The trial was far more severe than that which had been brought upon Adam. It was a very difficult thing. It was worse than what Adam had to go through. Compliance with the prohibition laid upon our first parents involved no suffering. But the command to Abraham demanded the most agonizing sacrifice. All heaven beheld with wonder and admiration Abraham's unfaltering obedience. All heaven applauded his fidelity. Satan's accusations were shown to be false. When God said, Oh, Abraham, he's the father of the faithful. And Satan said, Oh, but he failed here, he failed there, he failed there, he failed there. And after he left Ur of Chaldees, he failed. Yes, after we leave, we also may experience failure. But when we experience failure, the only way that we are able to redeem that failure is by a more trying and a more severe test. And so God tested Abraham. And in this test, when Abraham was an old man, when Abraham was now weak physically, he was no longer a young man, it is then that Abraham's faith shone out because he had the experience of faith over those years. When Abraham failed, he did not excuse it for years. He repented each time. Genesis 22, verse 4. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and he saw the place afar off. Could you imagine going through this experience for three days? For three days wondering, oh, what is going to happen? Is this the voice of God or is it not the voice of God? For three days, the temptation was there. It was not a test right now and that was the test was over. No, the test came and for three days, he never heard the voice of God again. And then the faith of Abraham shines out in verse 5. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again unto you. What does he tell them? He tells them, You servants, you remain right here. Isaac and I are going to go worship God, and Isaac and I are coming back. And Abraham said unto the, his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship, and come again to you. Did Abraham believe he's going to go up there and sacrifice Isaac? Yes, he did. God said, offer him up as a sacrifice. Abraham was going to go up on that mountain, as difficult as it may be, and he knew to himself. He is going to obey God no matter what the cost. You could imagine there Abraham building that altar and Isaac asking the question, Father, we have the wood, we have the fire, but where is the lamb? At first he says God will provide us a lamb. And once they get everything settled, Abraham tells Isaac, Isaac, God said, you are the lamb. Isaac had to make a choice. Isaac had to make a decision. I am strong. This old man can't stop me. He could have packed up and run away. But no, Isaac doesn't do that. Isaac in submission lets himself be bound. He lays there on that altar of sacrifice. And Abraham takes a knife. And with his knife in his hand, he lifts up the knife and is about to kill Isaac. But why does he going to kill Isaac? What reason? 
How does this show that faith? Because God said, in Isaac shall your seed be called. And Isaac had no child. Why did Abraham say, I'm going to come back with Isaac? Because Isaac had no children. And the promise must be fulfilled in Isaac. Now how can Isaac fulfill the promise if he's dead? Well, there's only one thing. Abraham had to believe. Abraham had to have that genuine trusting faith. That if he obeys God faithfully, if he kills Isaac, God must still fulfill the promise through Isaac. Therefore, I, the only way to fulfill that promise is to resurrect Isaac. Isaac God, must be resurrected by God. Abraham would do everything God said. But this one thing, he had to trust in God. God will have to resurrect Isaac. Hebrews 11, verses 17 through 19. Hebrews 11. 17 through 19. By faith Abraham, when he was tested, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from whence also he received him in the figure. You see, Abraham had faith. That faith was in God's Word and God's Word alone. To all outward surroundings, it seems impossible. But God's Word said it. Abraham believed the Word of God just because God's Word said it. Everything else seemed impossible, but God said it and that was it for Abraham. Many of us today do not experience victory. Why not? Volume 2. 445 to 446. Volume 2, 445 to 446. I have stated before that from what has shown me, but a small number of those now professing to believe the truth will eventually be saved. Why only a small number? Not because they could not be saved, but because they would not be saved in God's appointed way. The only way for Abraham was to do this in God's appointed way. And that God's appointed way was exercising faith that God was going to resurrect Isaac. But how do you know if it's God's appointed way? John 10, 27 says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Unless we know the shepherd's voice, we will not know whether God is saying it or not. A story is told of a man who was up in the mountains going for a walk. This was somewhere in the mountains of Europe some time ago. And as he was walking through the mountains, he looked all around him and he saw sheep everywhere. Sheep were grazing. And all of a sudden, a sound was heard and all those sheep stopped what they were doing. They froze in their spot. And this man looked there and he thought, this is strange. Every sheep is just frozen, not doing anything. And then he heard a sound again. He thought, what is this? All the sheep looked to where the sound was coming from. And the third time the sound was heard again. And all the sheep began to run. And he thought, well, I better run too. And he began to run to see, where are these sheep running? He kept running and running over the hill, down to the next valley, over the next hill. And all of a sudden, he saw what they were running to. It was the shepherd. The shepherd was giving his call. That impressed him so much that he went home and he told his young bride, I am changing my occupation. I am going to become a shepherd. And so he did. He became a shepherd. He learned the shepherd's call. One day, the young couple were going to have a child. And he said to himself, wow, this is going to be wonderful because I am going to teach my son to be a shepherd. From his childhood, he's going to know how to give the shepherd's call. And that day came. His wife was in labor. And his daughter was born. Well, a little bit disappointed, but he says, it doesn't matter. 
She's going to be a shepherdess. She's going to still learn the shepherd's call. And as she was growing up from childhood into young womanhood, she learned the shepherd's call herself. And one day as she was getting older, the man says, Oh no, she's not going to be just any kind of shepherdess. She is going to be the most educated shepherdess. I want her to go and receive a university education. Now since there was no university in the village in which they lived, he had to send her to a distant city. He had some friends there. And they can keep a watch out for her. And so he sent her to that city. At first she used to write letters home of how wonderful things were. He was really happy to see all those letters. And then as time went on, there were less frequent and less frequent letters until finally no letters at all. And the father began to be a little bit concerned. What is happening to my daughter? He wrote to his friend in that city. And the friend replied, Your daughter has gotten into the wrong crowd. She's gotten into the wrong type of people. She's left all the principles of her childhood and is now in the low class down in Skid Row. She has quit college. He said, can you talk to her? So the man tried to talk to her, but there was no help. And one day the father decided there's only one thing to do. He said, I must go find my daughter. He went to the university city. He went there to find her in the university. She was nowhere to be found. He went down the skid row. He looked everywhere. For three days he searched for her. But her friends heard that he was coming. They did not want to lose her. So what they did is they hid her from him. They kept her away from him so that he could not find her. And after three days, in desperation, he did not know what else to do. He searched the whole city and nowhere could he find his daughter. And so there was only one thing left to do. He got up early in the morning, six o'clock in the morning. He went out into the middle of the city, right near the Skid Row section. He knew she must be somewhere there. And from the top of his voice, as he did in the mountains, he gave the shepherd's call. Her friends heard this call. And they said to her, What kind of a crazy man is this? They did not know it was her father. They said, What kind of a crazy man is this to get up so early in the morning and make such noises? When she heard the voice, she stopped what she was doing. After a little while, he gave the shepherd's call again. This time, she looked out the window, thinking about her childhood, thinking about all her life experiences. And then the third time, she heard the shepherd's call again. She could resist no longer. She immediately left her friends behind. She went out to her father. They were united again. And he took her away home and rescued her. Now, my friends, what was the difference? What was the difference between what she heard and what her friends heard? They both heard the same thing, but she recognized the shepherd's voice. And in recognizing the shepherd's voice, she was saved. My friend, do you recognize the shepherd's voice? Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice. And I know them, and they follow me. Have you been hearing the shepherd's call? Then now is the time to respond to that call. Respond with the faith of Abraham and trust in nothing else but his word and his word alone. Now is the time. Now is your day of opportunity. Mm -hmm.